Good evening and welcome to Green Screen. I'm your host, Sam Murray, and over the next few months, we're going to be bringing you a wide range of online film screenings and invite you to join our debates on the future of Europe post-COVID recovery and making our societies more resilient and sustainable. Each month, the Green Screen is dedicated to a key theme to look at how we can explore the challenges that are faced in Europe. These debates tend to happen on the third week of each month, and a film screening will be made available for free on our platform for 48 hours on the Wednesday and the Thursday. And then as you are here now, you can see that you can then follow a live debate on an issue that is inspired by the film, which will take place usually on the Thursday around this time uh, every month. Tonight is an edition of Green Screen that we really wish we didn't have to make, and that is responding to Ukraine's struggle for freedom and democracy, and to really understand the shock that has been the Russian invasion, which began a month ago today. In preparing for tonight's debate, I spoke to friends of mine who have been experiencing this conflict in many different ways, from joining the fight and picking up arms, to having to witness the horrors in person, or at distance and finding new ways to help from afar. I spoke to my friend Sofia Vara, who has escaped the Russian invasion with her two-year-old daughter and recently made uh, it to Belgium. She gave me the following message to pass on to say that today it's already a month from the Russian invasion of Ukraine. All this time we are all living beyond pain. We have to make hard decisions and there is no good option. The list of Russian crimes is already huge, and what has happened in Mariupol, Kyiv, Sumy, where women were sexually assaulted and children were killed, maternity hospitals as well, which were bombed. But the, one of the biggest crimes is that they stole our time in happiness and peace with people we love. Sophia said that me and my two-year-old daughter had to become refugees. They took me from my house, husband, friends, business. They took my daughter from her father's hugs. I also spoke to my friend Kate Samuels, who is a Ukrainian living in Scotland and is currently running to be elected to become hopefully Glasgow's first ever Ukrainian councillor, working with various initiatives from afar, such as Cook for Ukraine, to support the efforts to repel the invasion. When I asked her what I should say tonight, Kate said that mentioned that it's one month since the war has started and that she feels that some governments are not doing as much as they could to support Ukraine, that there have been issues around housing, that loads of Ukrainian women had been telling her that some of the housing has not been safe enough, and that the governments in countries like the UK have only promised light security checks. She said that we need to keep protesting and ensuring this stays in the news, that we must donate more, and that solidarity is nice, but without money, we will not be able to rebuild Ukraine or support its people. She said to me, I'm encouraging people to keep wearing Ukrainian colours to keep conversations growing. Uh, and in response to that, obviously, I've decided uh, to wear Ukrainian colours this evening. And she said that she wants people to think about doing one thing a day for Ukraine or Ukrainians as well. So today's film uh, that we are going to be uh, screening, that you still can screen at the moment, is Maidan. It's a film that documents the unfolding of the Maidan revolution in Kyiv and gives us pause for reflection as we witness the horrors of the Russian invasion of Ukraine today. So before we begin our discussion, let's take a look at the trailer for our film, Maidan. <sighs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Я, вибачте, шановна громада, це задивився на вас. І нашу громадську частину, як належить, треба почати з державного гімну, правда? So our film is obviously still available uh, to stream and you can visit the film on the green screen website after our discussion today. Our panel this evening brings together actors from civil society and journalism to help us try to make sense of and understand the horrors of the Russian invasion unfolding at the moment. But before I introduce the panelists, I just want to mention that obviously some of our speakers are joining us from Ukraine today. Uh, and may have to leave, for example, if there may be an air raid siren that goes off during the discussion. So uh, if our speakers disappear, this may be why that's happened. And we just ask for, obviously, understanding. Uh, so I'm going to introduce the speakers that we have joining us today. So first of all, we have Sofia Olinik, who is from Democracy Support and Human Security Programme Coordinator at the Heinrich Böll Foundation in the Kyiv office in Ukraine. We also have uh, Nastia Stanko, who is the broad, a broadcast journalist for Hromadska uh, and was involved in documenting a lot of what was happening uh, during the Maidan revolution and is currently in Kyiv as well today. Uh, and we also have Roland uh, Tomota, who is a reporter for the daily newspaper De Standard and specializes in Central Europe. We will hopefully be joined uh, at some point in our discussion today by Maria Zolkina, who is a political analyst from Ilkol Kucherev Democratic Initiatives Foundation. But Maria is currently in transit and hopefully will be able to join, but there may be a possibility that she cannot today. So Nastia, I wonder if I could come to you first and ask for you if you can kind of explain to us what is happening at the moment in Ukraine and how it is to, to witness the horrors of this invasion that are unfolding uh, around you at the moment. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I am in Kyiv now. I am in the uh, capital of Ukraine. Uh, in Kyiv every day we hear, we see shelling. Um, it's different district, mostly Podil district. Uh, it's a... Uh, Shevchenkovsky district, a different district in Kyiv, um, were already under the shelling attacks. And um, uh, dozens of, of people in Kyiv were killed already, uh, also many injured. Uh, I was, for example, uh, a couple of days ago in Ohmadit, it's uh, the biggest uh, children's hospital, and uh, now they are try to save not only uh, injured children, but uh, also adults. And uh, it's awful stories uh, we can hear there and saw there. Uh, even uh, American journalist was killed near Kiev. Uh, his colleague, uh, cameraman, was injured there. I was uh, when he had uh, operation surgery and uh, everything what we see on the streets it's something that for example i can't believe uh, till now uh, already months we live in this uh, in this war um, 
which Russian bring to our land, but um, uh, we can't imagine. For example, what I do now, I try to, like, we want to go to Chernihiv. Um, the couple of bridges are already destroyed by Russians, and uh, it's very difficult to come there. The people there, they don't have electricity, water, connections, uh, nothing. And uh, as people in Mariupol also, but um, they have some small opportunity to evacuate from Chernihiv. People in Mariupol, uh, they mostly don't have this opportunity. They can go by their cars, but we know that some people, uh, it's uh, it's already thousands, 6,000 people are um, uh, like take as a hostages to Russia. Uh, Russians uh, to take their passports uh, uh, and uh, just uh, uh throw them to Russia some somewhere in Tahanroch or Siberia or other places and it's uh, just uh, awful that we can we can read this and it's it's we can't imagine that it's happened in real time now uh we try to find out uh, where is mother of my one of the best friends because she was in Mariupol and um there is there was no connection with her for 14 days and my friend she's she was already like uh, say goodbye to her mother for many times she saw that he was died already it's uh, you can't imagine that there is no connection with your the 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 the, the lava relative and uh, yeah but now we know that she is in safety safety place she came many kilometers to her sister house in some villages near mariupol it's also dangerous there but she is like she is alive that's everything we know now and, and uh, we also try to find our another friend who is a journalist photo correspondent he was uh, on the phone in Cetin of uh march and from that period we don't know nothing about him just that he was uh somewhere in the front line near kiev and after nothing we don't know if he's still alive or where is he and uh, these stories i came to me like every day and this is not you know my stories it's stories of everyone in, in in ukraine you know and it's uh, you you even don't know how to share this because everyone has this awful stories this uh, stories which you can't imagine that it can happen now in reality and thank you very much for for sharing those stories with us i think it's vitally important that you know we can get these stories out to as many people as possible to hear and to understand what is happening uh, in Ukraine. So thank you so much for, for sharing those with us. Uh, Sophia, I wonder if I could come to you next um, and really get a sense of what role do you think that civil society organizations are playing at the moment uh, on the front line in terms of providing support to, to repel the invasion that's, that's happening? Thank you so much, uh, Sam, and I'm happy to join the discussion today. Um, I think like uh, what what we witness right now, and in in the from the perspective of civil society, is quite immense chunk of work that is might be at some point considered as uh, just volunteering, but it's not just volunteering. We saw like how the civil society has came to the prim primary stage in uh, during Maidan, and how the civil society became this like a key player for Ukrainian democracy, for Ukrainian independence that we are fighting for now in 2022 which is ridiculous this happening but this is the reality that we live we saw uh, like uh, our foundation is working very closely on supporting grassroots activists and the civil society in ukraine in different fields in uh, uh, sustainable mobility in urban development critical history gender democracy or environmental issues and today we, we would love that our partners would be dealing with these issues but today they are fight, they are literally volunteering they are helping their uh, friends either by collecting humanitarian aid or uh, joining territorial defense units 
we can talk about urban development, but we will talk about this uh, when it's over. But at the moment, what we observe is that uh, our friends, uh, our partners, they literally completely change what they are doing in daily normal life. Normal life, I would say something what has been before 24th of February, since starting from 24th of February when Russia invaded Ukraine. That's like a literally new era that has come, entered, but something that we wouldn't love to have and to go through. And uh, we see how the, the nations are being co uh, collected all over Ukraine and the world, how literally everyone is trying to get everything, starting from food for people who were forced to leave their homes, closes up until bulletproof vests, uh, medical supply, everything. Because right now, what, what matters, literally every effort is being done, either to support the army or territorial defense units, or to support doctors with medical supplies. Uh, should it be also information resistance to, to share what's happening on the ground? This is what, what we see is happening. And no one at the, po at the moment, no one already talks what I'm doing in my normal life. Everyone talks what I can do and truth that this nightmare will be over as soon as it's possible and uh, i i literally admire what the, what i see how the solidarity is spreading around because on the one hand we have a military front line on the other hand we have cyber front line we have information front line and we have a, a along with the army that is fighting to protect us we have volunteers who are fighting to support and to come to, for this also for everyone to survive and to go through this. Because we see that the evocations are done, yes, they are done uh, quite quite often also with the support of lots of volunteers. And we have to recognize the role of the civil society and volunteers who are daily doing all that can be done uh, possible just to, uh, to save people, to save animals, to save uh, uh, children, everyone what what can be done and uh, and here yes we can talk about any projects uh, so capacity development measures when it's over when it's peace at the moment everyone is collecting humanitarian aid anything what can uh, improve the situation and uh, what what i observe and what what's crucial and what makes ukraine probably different from of a neighbor is that this, uh, the strength of civil society is this solidarity that has developed over the years and we see this like the uh, the crucial players whom i wouldn't i cannot imagine and i can't talk about ukraine now not mentioning what, what what's being done about these institutions that have been born and set up over the last eight years the the, the watch the civil society as a watchdog of this democracy and the changes that are be uh, taking place can I add, please, uh, a couple sure. of words about civil society and all of this? You know, yeah, it's very hot period of time um, in Ukraine and for Ukraine, of course. And for example, I am working in news. I, I make the reports uh, every day, interview and everything. I was in Kharkiv a couple of days ago and the situation there is like more dangerous and, and bad that in Kiev, of course, because in some uh, districts in Kharkiv where 100,000 people, of, uh, for example, live, still live, and uh, they are mostly living in the bomb shelters. Uh, their flats, their apartments are destroyed because it's uh, the uh, east part of Kharkiv and it's uh, the closest part to Russian army now and uh, it's, it's it's destroyed from everything tanks um, shelling uh, rockets everything you know and it's all the time it's it's very dangerous place there but people yeah they they still live there but what i see um, in all this uh, um, Evil, you know, all I, what I see, I see volunteers who help 100,000 people and they came together like for uh, 24 hours and they came with food, with medicine, with everything, uh, people from Lviv, from abroad, um, 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 uh, sent buses to Kharkiv, in Kharkiv people under the shelling volunteer came and bring this food, everything to these bomb shelters and it's something like 
that also I can't I can't imagine that this happened in reality. And what is I saw, for example, in um, um, army hospital. Uh, uh, in Kiev, uh, the the biggest uh, the biggest uh, hospital for soldiers. That I saw volunteers who are working uh, as as ma medical volunteers from Maidan Revolution. You know, and they said me that we organized for a couple of hours when the war started because we were here from the beginning, from Maidan Revolution, and then after when war was beginning in 2014, yeah, in Donbass, and we are here, like, okay, we call our other friends, our other volunteers, and they came, uh, like, after three hours, and we have everything after 24 hours for, like, for, for all we need, and this is something that um, looks like, you know, some miracle, how, how everything is works. Um, nobody uh, even waiting for I don't know administration authorities will do something yeah. for help. They they also do something, but I mean that people don't wait for for anything. They just do everything that they could and even more than they could. And I know that people, for example, in Viv who are dying on this. I mean from tired uh, in this. Um, all, all these places where uh, aid came, they they think that they do not more, that they, they can't do more, and they are like they feel themselves guilty that they are in safety place more safety place than, for example, in Kiev and in Kharkiv, you know, and they think what I can do more for these people, and this is something that you know that give me hope to live tomorrow, for example, or after tomorrow, because it's very hard to do this. But we, when you see er, er, everything, this pain and, and blood and dead bodies, because it's everywhere, you know, dead bodies, it's, I see dead bodies every day. But, but when I see this uh, power of people, I, I want to live tomorrow, you know? It is. In fact, we have uh, the saying that the Ukrainian volunteers can get literally everything from the underground. Like you just say, give a shout, and uh, and then you you mobilize all your network. We have, we work, for example, with uh, we have one of the projects that we support is Green Academy, and our alumni, the group is uh, of civil society activists. This is just a, there is a telegram chat and saying a shout, I need to evacuate people who knows the context where to find someone or to, I'm delivering, uh, there is some delivery of some uh, humanitarian aid, who needs what? And this is like, everyone is just constantly engaged and uh, trying to support each other. And uh, like one, some of the other partners, they are in uh, encircled territories in Chernihiv region. And uh, in meantime, they, uh, one of our friends is managing to fundraise money for bulletproof uh, vests for her team. And just, just you simply see people are not giving up. And uh, this resistance is in, on different front lines, as we observe. I wonder at this point, uh, Roland, if I if I can bring you into the discussion. Uh, obviously, you've, you've mentioned to me that you've you've been in Poland uh, at the moment, and I wonder if you can give a sense of what what you've witnessed in terms of the solidarity from other European nations uh, to to support Ukraine and the effort to to repel the Russian invasion. Well, I think what you see in Poland is is um, is, is something really remarkable, which is solidarity across the board on the left, on the right, um, from, you know, all kinds of Polish citizens. I mean, I've been talking to people who, um, a, uh, uh, a lady who just came in from Slavyansk and said, I, I showed up at the station in the middle of the night and there, there was someone waiting in a car uh, who said, do you need help? Um, she said yes. And uh, uh, half an hour later, she was in someone's home who's now become her friend. And, uh, and, and her permanent uh, host. Um, and, and this is just one of, of hundreds of thousands uh, stories really uh, right here. So, um, and uh, yeah, I've, I've also seen people who, uh, for instance, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, Polish citizens who are still driving from the safety of Krakow into uh, Kharkiv uh, every uh, every uh, 48 hours. Uh, they, uh, they, they bring um, a humanitarian aid, but they also bring vests, they uh, bring uh, helmets. Um, and then they uh, they come back with uh, with a, a van load full of uh, full of people. Um, and uh, you know, one of their colleagues was just killed last week. 
uh, and still they they keep on doing it. Um, so that is yeah, it's it's uh, it's 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 almost hard to believe. Um, and and still and yet it's 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 happening at the same point. Um, I think in Poland, uh, what's also been remarkable is that a country that hasn't. Uh, really been keen uh, on migration has uh, opened itself up and, and there's there's many reasons uh, for that I think one of the reasons is that people do identify uh, with, uh, with with their Ukrainian neighbors is also this this uh, broader sense of threat and almost feeling vindicated uh, sadly by by what's happening now in the sense that um, a lot of Polish uh, uh, observers on the on the right, but but also on the left, uh, felt that they were much more alive to the to 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 the threat of of well Russian aggression in their region than their Western European counterparts uh, were, and that they were being cast as basically you know almost neocons just for pointing pointing uh, these things out in the past, and and now they feel well, this is what's what's happening. Um, if they look at Germany, for instance. Uh, they do feel that uh, someone like uh, yeah, the general feeling in Poland about someone like like uh, uh, Angela Merkel, but especially Schröder in in Germany, is um, that they were uh, uh, hugely mistaken. They've really fallen from from their pedestal here, um, and so in that sense, um, yeah, I, I I think that that a lot of what we uh, maybe as Western Europeans can learn from this is that uh, is just. To uh, to take our uh, um, our colleagues uh, in in Poland in Ukraine and uh, and neighboring countries much more seriously and uh, um, and and yeah, I, it's everything is happening now is attesting to that. Thank you, Roland. Uh, the the next question that I, I want to ask, and feel free anyone to to kind of jump in on on this one if you want to answer. But what parts of the more recent history of Ukraine, including what's happening today, do you feel are really misunderstood? Uh, and do you feel that we should be aware of as we are witnessing the invasion happening? I think that the the, the most uh, the, the big the biggest maybe problem which I hear from uh, journalists from abroad still that. Uh, some story about you know two Ukrainians. Uh, uh, one is Russian speaking, and another one is Ukrainian speaking uh, Ukraine. And like this is different people. They are voting for different uh, parties, leaders, and all of these things. And I think that this narrative was for eight years. Um, and uh, sometimes I hear its narrative now, but we see. Uh, for this month that people in Russian speaking Kherson, people in Russian speaking Kharkiv, people because 90% of uh, people who live in Kharkiv, they are speaking Russian, and 90% of people who live in Kherson, uh, they are speaking Russian, they don't want to see uh, Russian army, Russian soldiers, they don't need protection um, from Russia, They nobody uh, wants to... Um, invite Russian with uh, flowers and we see how uh, Kherson is fighting uh, even under occupation now is fighting with Russian they came with uh, black and uh, blue and uh, yellow flags uh, uh, on the streets even when Russians uh, 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 sh 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 try to shoot uh, to shoot them and uh, I think that it was a wrong narrative that uh, um, you, some part of Ukraine is pro-Russian and some part of Ukraine is pro-European. It's not... Sorry, I have this uh, uh, siren and the siren is, uh, is already a <laughs> stop. Uh, I, I have this message all the time in Kiev. It's our reality now. Sorry about this. Yeah, I think that it's very important to say, to mention that there is no different Ukraine and different Ukrainians who want to, to join Russia. And I think that this narrative was also wrong when we were talking about Donbass region. I was working in Donbass uh, when the war was started from, uh, from the beginning, you know, from... Uh, 
April, May 2014. I was even uh, in March and in in February 2014 in the, in the Crimea before this annexation. People were just under the Russian propaganda. They believed in in such uh, crazy things. Uh, they believed that the uh, uh, right sector is in Crimea mount are uh, in Crimea mountains with uh, all the uh, guns, tanks, and something waiting for kill cr- cr- people from Crimea. You know, and uh, like the Russian army and Russian president will protect them from from the war and something. It was it, when I heard this. I saw that they are like um, crazy, but like ninety percent of these people, they told me this. And uh, but now, all the world see how Russian propaganda works. And when they when they say Lavrov or, or Putin that we are not invade Ukraine, they already d- did this, and they say we are not invade Ukraine. Everything is okay. Ukraine is our, like, I don't know, sister or brother. And all this bullshit about some birds uh, who um, poison only Russians. So, you know, it's crazy. Like, normal uh, person who know I don't know, chemical studying at school can say that it's bullshit. But they say this. And many Russians believe in this. And the same was happening in Crimea. And after in Donbass region, I think that even some Ukrainians be- believed in this shit that people from Donbass are some different, that they are collaborants or something like this. But now when we see people who came back to Kyiv, for example, where is not um, it, where is more dangerous than in the beginning of war, you know, but people back to, to their home because they w- want to be at their home. Someone can't evacuate from Siege uh, cities because they have relatives who can't walk, for example, and who are very old for this. And we see, we see this everywhere. And I saw this in Donbass in 2014, 2015. And when we made these stories, some Ukrainians even say that they are collaborants, that's why they are they want to stay in Donbass and be with this so-called Donetsk people or Luhansk people Republic. This is the same narrative from Russia. And I think that now world uh, see all this bullshit, but what the price? What the price of everything? Like every day we have dozens uh, or even, I don't know, hundreds uh, dead people, children. Uh, I, you know, you, you see uh, everything, but the price is too high. Yeah, and if if I can just, if I may just add to that, it's it's what what you're saying rings rings absolutely true, especially when it comes about the narrative. Um, when we're talking about this narrative about two Ukraines, you know, the Ukrainian speaking, supposedly uh, Western Ukraine, and then the the uh, and then the East, this whole narrative, uh, you know, that 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 you can just divide a country um into into two halves somehow well it it doesn't only dovetail with with uh, the, the the logic that uh, the kremlin uses and 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 its purposes um it's it's uh but it's been very effectively um uh, been bandied around by the kremlin throughout those years uh, and and it's an appealing narrative for people who don't really want to spend too much time uh, looking at what's happening in ukraine a country that they may not have understood before etc uh, it also chimes with uh, what people know about recent history in yugoslavia which is for the russians uh, also something they they often uh, focus on um so so it's it's a very um uh, it's sadly it's an appealing way for people to look at uh, at at uh, what's happening in ukraine and what was happening in ukraine through this lens of inter-ethnic strife etc and that just serves the the kremlin propaganda um and and a lot of it does stem from notions about yugoslavia i think as well i mean sometimes in this propaganda you see this this uh fairly relentless kremlin trolling uh, uh, uh b- because uh, uh the balkan wars were the wars where the West intervened. So they, they tried to create these kind of false equivalences between uh, NATO uh, in, intervening in Serbia and um, uh, and 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 uh, uh, Russia intervening to uh, stop the quote-unquote uh, genocide in, in, Don, in Donbass. 
Um, so yeah, it's really not doing justice at all to uh, to to the Ukrainian uh, people to to talk about uh, Russian speaking uh, uh, East uh, Ukrainians and uh, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, Ukrainian speaking Western Ukrainians. And still, that was a, a narrative that was still fairly successful, I would say. And, and it's it's really nefarious. Uh, if if I may jump in here. I mean, like it is in fact successful, but and this disinformation. I mean, like for me, I see it as a tool for um, implementation of this imperialist moods that Russia is having on upon Ukraine. That's like they cannot give up the idea that Ukraine is a democratic state, and it's like there is a it's a sovereign state, and invasion for the sake of peacekeeping mission in Donbas or protecting Russian speaking minor minorities or uh, Russian speakers. I'm sorry, it's it doesn't work like this. And as like I said, the main idea is that Russia is trying to treat that Ukraine is one of those colonies that needs some help from the bigger brother. It's the bigger brother. It's not the brother who is killing uh, and literally shelling. We see 1,200 uh, missiles hitting Ukraine within a month, and this is not a peacekeeping. And uh, this narrative of saving, protecting, and uh, preventing genocide, I think like genocide is already happening in Mariupol. And the, the information saying like that the Russians are not uh, shelling it on civilians, this doesn't work. And this is not the way it, it's like the saving or protecting anyone works. And like, we didn't ask for this. All we want, we have, want to have a safe country, but we don't have air raid servants every single day for multiple of times, and where not people are dying literally everywhere. And uh, like to, to manipulate with this denazification or something, coming up with lots of these fakes about the chemical weapons. I mean, like this is uh, this is not true. I mean, like Ukraine signed a Budapest memorandum to be anti-nuclear, uh, the country without nuclear weapons. And now we have Russia who is threatening us with this, claiming that uh, Ukraine is having ones. I mean, like the fact checking and of what's happening and these main narratives is Im uh, immense. Like uh, the other day there was uh, on Twitter, uh, the embassy of Russia in South Africa or somewhere putting a map with the bio labs across Ukraine like seriously and this is what Nastya said uh, mentioned about the chicken that are carrying uh, some chemical uh, uh, chemicals killing on the virus killing only Russians like seriously are we gonna believe in this today in uh, having all this information that we have I think we've seen so many of these horrendous stories such as Russia spinning the narrative of Nazification when you have a Jewish president which is exactly. wholly unbelievable to, to witness and to see. Um, we've we've just had a question in for the audience that is kind of uh, relevant to to this current discussion, and this has come in from uh, Anna Rubes. Um, I think our team are going to pop it onto the screen in a second when it comes up. But uh, Anna has asked us, there's something uh, effective that we can do uh, from our countries to fight misinformation that's coming from Russia. Um, Sophia, I wonder if I could come to you first on this, because of, mm -hmm. obviously in our conversation in preparation for this discussion, you did mm -hmm. mention uh, that you've been working on uh, identifying the key narratives. And I wonder if you could kind mm -hmm. of talk us through those key narratives that have emerged. Uh, yeah, was it like literally, as I mentioned before, that uh, lots of our partners and civil society activists, we are no, no longer dealing with the things that we were, do in normal lives. Therefore, we've launched the website sharethetruth.org where we try to prepare the every day the briefs uh, like five minutes reads literally condensed information about what's happening in ukraine and off and on we have uh, we have uh, an expert that we collaborate with uh, also Oliana Moshan, who prepares uh, the over uh, overviews of what russian media is uh, writing about and uh, recently one of us like there are some five uh, some up to five uh, main narratives that we observe over the last month the, that the uh, russian media trying to speculate with is uh, first is that uh, about the civilians and uh, that Russia is not uh, hitting them, uh, uh, launching the missiles or attacks upon civilians, which is 
not true. The truth is that, uh, as we see, the death toll of civilians is immense these days. And the situation, especially among the, the most brightest example, is Mariupol, the maternity hospital. Uh, or a Mariupol drama theater where the civilians were hiding and in the hospitals there were women, pregnant women, there were children and the missiles and the bombs were literally shot down there and this is uh, the, the, like the whole world scene where how uh, how the attacks upon civilians are happening. So one of the main, one of the first narratives is that uh, uh, Russian troops are not hitting uh, civilians uh, another thing is about the Nazification that uh, this, uh, the, military, the operations on the Nazification in Ukraine. We have a Jewish president, and we know how the, the like. I literally don't understand why the, the, it takes uh, the roots this myth of the Nazification because. Uh, um, Quite a lot is being said about the radicals uh, being present in Ukraine and this uh, uh, Russian army is trying to protect us from nationalists or Nazis. I mean, like the people we have see fighting today on the streets, they are trying to protect the country and to fight for the territory and for the lives of the people who are staying here. The, another, the third thing is about the biological and chemical weapons or nuclear weapons that Ukraine is uh, uh, blowing up. And for example, that uh, in Kharkiv, the Institute of Physics has been bl blown up uh, just because of the chemical weapons or nuclear weapons being developed there. Again, this is like a scientific institution, the university institution, and uh, this is like a massive spreading around about this, uh, the weapons, which is again, this like this is not true, or that Ukraine is shelling its own territories. Like, why would we shell our own territories? That uh, Russian are not uh, shelling uh, Ukrainian territories. We see every day the death toll, and we see the damaged cities. Like, you just scroll through the news. Like, check the Hormatsky website. You will see all the the videos and the fo footages uh, from the from the spots, and. Uh, Last but not least, that Ukraine uh, Ukraine is preventing evacuations uh, and uh, not allowing the humanitarian corridors, or the Ukrainians are leaving uh, to Russia on their own uh, from Mariupol. What we see the last two days is uh, not the last two days during the last week. That is, uh, Russia is forcefully depredating and uh, taking away people. And today there was again that the Livobarezhny district of Mariupol, thousands of people were uh, taken to Russia in an unknown direction. And their documents are taken away and no one knows where these people are staying. And today we are already talking about some 2,000 kids and uh, more civilians who are somewhere in Russia and no one knows where and what their life is. So like these are like these are five uh, some of the five narratives that we see being spread around but what's crucial is that uh, to fact, fact check what, what you're reading and also to share it among the people in your circles because i know it's easy to say it's like uh, there 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 is a news that has popped up when i see some news that i'm not 100 uh, sure i write to the people saying like for example yesterday i wrote to some people to my friends uh, asking it have you seen it anywhere else? How many sources did you see saying the same thing? And this is about, it's, again, when you see bullshit, you have to say, like, it's not the truth. Like, the truth is. And you have lots of Ukrainians who are reporting it. You have official channels available already in English that, you, that can be always checked what's the real situation. We have everyone from starting from the president to any, uh, literally to any grassroots activists that are writing about the truth that's happening. So therefore, it's crucial to see what what's, uh, what Ukrainians in Ukraine are writing about the situation here on the ground. And how, uh, how, how, how uh, do you get, oh, sorry, if you. Yes, 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 please. Yeah, I, I was just gonna ask both of you, uh, what do you think is most, um, is most effective at, at uh, yeah, sort of beaming that message into Russia? I mean, we've all, we all are aware that you have many Ukrainians who are telling the Russian friends or family members what's happening and maybe, you know, while they are being bombed or in a shelter and that, uh, and, and there's a lot of focus on the stories where that has not been effective and people out of disbelief or, or cognitive dissonance saying, well, I don't believe you uh, out of Russia, but maybe there's also a lot of stories where, um, yeah, people reaching out to people in Russia has, has been effective. And I, I don't know what, 
how you know what the channels are and what the messages are that 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 have been a reason to be more hopeful do perhaps i know i know one uh, uh, for example i know one project it's uh, a famous key restaurator restaurant restaurator uh, misha katsurin made the, this project it's called uh, uh, dead believe in russian papa Polier. Uh, his father uh, he's living in russia and uh, he doesn't believe that uh, his son uh, and uh, his grand uh, children are uh, sitting in the bomb shelters in the metro station and living uh, like there and uh, he started misha i mean he started to talking with his father talking like one week every day the next week and uh, he um like become to believe now that this is true you know but many like and many and many ukrainians uh, did the same as misha did and they tried to talk with her with their relatives but uh, it's still tough some of them don't believe to their children to their sisters and brothers and uh, they they are not talking anymore but uh, i see also that some uh, of ukrainians don't want to talk with their relatives in russia anymore because they think that this is like uh, unbelievable that they don't believe them like uh, i know one girl who who is from russia and uh, she has a ukrainian husband and now live here in ukraine in kiev and when she said all of the, the they live in the bomb shelter with uh, uh, eight months uh, old son. Uh, the, her father and mother, they also didn't believe. And she said that, okay, I have no relatives anymore. And I, have, I don't have parents anymore. I don't want to be uh, their daughter. And this is also some uh, bad... Uh, um, influence of russian propaganda it's 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 awful but uh, but what is scare me the most for example in mariupol um uh, russians they are going with this um, microphone and say to Mari uh, to people that um uh, they took odessa already and uh, zaporizhia Z uh, zaporizhia is not allowed um, to Mari to people from mariupol to came to zaporizhia and they like they they don't have choice just to go to russia and that's all you know and uh, people in mariupol they don't have connection with uh, with relatives uh, he here in uh, like in, in, in other uh, cities and towns in Ukraine, they don't have uh, four phones because it's uh, they they don't have opportunity to charge them, and uh, they think that they are just uh, alone and they don't have any choice. This is very bad because it's it's a question about their life you know and for example when i was in one bomb shelter in uh, kharkiv district saltivka which is absolutely destroyed one uh, old uh, uh, woman she asked me uh, if uh, our parliament is, is is stay you know she she asked me it's stay or it's it's destroyed already because in Saltivka, in this district, they they also don't have connection because all the um, connections uh, stations are also destroyed, and they don't have any information about what's happened in other towns and cities. And they saw that maybe like uh, Kiev already destroyed, and people from Irpin or Bucha or these sur suburbs of Kiev, they they also when they evacuate, they saw that. Uh, maybe Kyiv is already destroyed. It's a question of life for people, for many people, you know? What is propaganda and uh, Russian propaganda uh, uh, did and and still, still uh, what they do? Let us uh, also hear the question is uh, when you 
Well, like we have, everyone has these examples of the relatives of friends that uh, people are trying to reach out to convince. But uh, let's admit that the Russian propaganda machine has been working for years. It's not the question of a year or two. It's been for years that it's been uh, putting one side story. And now it's going to be even uh, more difficult in Russia to get any other uh, alternatives as uh, any independent independent media is gone and uh, and this this fake uh, the law on the fake news and criminal uh, penalty of, uh, for the any information a uh, real information about in the war in Ukraine like literally the the machine is working even uh, gonna work even harder to convince the people to say and i'm not sure even what would be the sources that people could get of the information except of the, some friends messaging them in different messengers saying was the situation but as we see it's if you live for many years on the one disinformation machine having a, a main uh, state channel saying uh, just showing one side of the story it's quite difficult afterwards to uh, to, to convert or to to pass any other point of the idea. Roland, I wonder. If uh, I can... uh, sorry, sorry, oh, sorry. sorry. It was, it was, it was a question about what country can do with Russian propaganda, like uh, to fight against Russian propaganda. I think it's very important to uh, bring journalists uh, from all our all the world to Ukraine, just. Uh, to see by their eyes what's happened here, it's very important. But they should, I don't know, know something, read something about Ukraine, Ukrainian history and everything. We can help uh, all of Ukrainian journalists, help uh, to foreign jo journalists uh, like day and night, every day. For example, I'm working with, I don't know, 20 or 30 journalists here, uh, foreign, uh, to help them with everything. I think it's very important because they can see by their eyes uh, what happened in reality and uh, how was important when a, jo a photo correspondent and videographer from uh, Associated Press was in Mariupol and um, all the world uh, saw this picture from uh, uh, maternity hospital, yeah, w which was destroyed also. And Russia after said that its actors... Uh, we 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 didn't uh, bomb um, uh, maternity hospital. It was the Azov battalion uh, um, camp, uh, and you know Russians always said that everything is Azov battalion camp. For them, um, the theater is Azov battalion camp. Maternity hospital is Azov battalion camp. Every everywhere is just Azov battalion camp, and it's just also crazy crazy things you know and uh, if the journalists from associated press were not there nobody like saw how terrible disaster and what terrible things uh, Ru russia russia did thank you nastia uh roland i wonder if i could i could bring you in to uh answer this particular question as well, because it's also useful for, for those of us outside of Ukraine to bear in mind what kind of sources we're engaging with. with. And both um, Nastia and Sofia have given us an idea of some of those narratives that, that are being spent. Uh, from, from your perspective, Roland, do you think any of the, the Russian propaganda has, has taken any seat in anywhere within uh, Europe outside of Russia and Belarus? Uh, and how do you think that we can be aware, those of us who are outside of, of Ukraine uh, be aware of what kind of sources we're engaging with and what kind of stories that we're hearing. Well, yeah, I, I, I do believe that what Sophia said is really uh, pertinent in the sense that, um, yes, I mean, the, the, the answer to is, is Russian propaganda present uh, uh, outside of, of, of Ukraine um, and, and also in Western Europe is, uh, of course, yes. Uh, the same goes for a lot of countries in Central Europe. Um, but it, it happens within a certain context, and um, uh, and uh, I, I think countries as, as Russia and its intelligence services have managed to uh, exploit uh, divisions within societies. They have managed to exploit the fact that uh, information spaces have, have been narrowing. They have managed to uh, act as, uh, um, you know, the suppliers of, of uh, disinformation for um, in, in, in states with an already uh, a propagandistic uh, media apparatus. So it's what's really most effective is working, um, 
you know, working in a slightly more long-term way and in, in, in ensuring that that journalistic pluralism, but that that yeah, and and the uh, the free information space can keep on existing. And in that sense, we've yeah. we've, uh, we've been allowing um, uh, uh, that to uh, yeah, freedom of, of 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 a lot of journalists and and freedom of expression to be whittled away, uh, even in the European Union. And we're still allowing it while uh, uh, saying that we are uh, standing with Ukraine. Um, so, you know, uh, compromising, I think, on uh, the pluralism of the media in, in Hungary, uh, Poland, or uh, accession countries such as Serbia, um, uh, in the name of solidarity with Ukraine, would be the most cynical outcome, and still it is what uh, uh, some people will be, be clamoring for. Um, and, and that's the, um, a, one of the, the really problematic things about, about disinformation is that is when people spread it willingly. Um, and, and that's really, that's what's happening uh, uh, a lot. The most, uh, the really the most uh, effective uh, disinformation workers are the people who do it for free, uh, who, are, who are not paid agents, but uh, whom the message just speaks to because they feel victimized uh, for, for, for different reasons because um, yeah, uh, some, some things might've gone uh, wrong recently or uh, in, in their lives or just uh, societally, et cetera. And you see that, any kind of, of disinformation, not only the Russian one, is really good at picking up those messages and then tailoring it to the to, to the local atmosphere to just so so division within society. So it doesn't always have to be uh, pro-Russian or, or anti-Ukrainian. Uh, often it's just trying to exploit the, the the frictions that are already there within our societies. And I think as, as with all kinds of disinformation, it is really important uh, just to go back to what Sophia was saying about being able to use critical thinking skills and analysing how to engage with those sources. And this is actually something I talk about a lot in my day job as a university lecturer when we look at how we actually evaluate and analyse them. So to really check out what is that source of that information, uh, to really look at where the link kind of follows back to, who is posting it, are you aware of that person who is posting it? Uh, and also the other thing that happens a lot is a lot of people share things without reading articles and really engaging what's involved in it. So always make sure you've read an article if you're if you're going to be sharing it to make sure uh, that, that that is you know correct information. Um, and also we if there's any particular sources uh, that are recommended, uh, you know I, I will invite our panelists obviously at, at, at some point to share those with us and we can hopefully, show reliable uh, sources of information as well. Um, we just had another question come through in the chat, um, and this is from Bet Poll. Um, and this is asking, are the events of the Maidan re revolution connected with the invasion that we are witnessing today? So this is, this is just open to any of the panelists if anyone would like to respond to that. I can start just a few words. Mm -hmm. um, even in this uh, movie of Serhii Lozhnitya, uh, we can hear the words from Vladimir Putin, what he thought about our Maidan, people in Maidan that they are also Nazis and all of this uh, bullshit which, which we hear today also. Uh, we know that uh, he was very angry uh, about our Maidan and Russia um, gave uh, to the Prime Minister Azar of that time the grenades for protesters and all of the things agents from First Bear and generals from First Bear were also uh, here on Maidan uh, during the revolution before the shooting on the protesters. Now, of course, everything is connection, uh, has this connection. Many of my friends who are still alive and they are now at war again because they were at war in 2014 2015 and they tried to back to normal life and now they are also uh, again on the front line they say said me many times that uh, the 20th of february 2014 was the first day of their war because it's it, for them it was looks like war, you know, because they, sh they shell it by bullets. Uh, I mean, the Berkut shelling by them, by protest on on protesters. And of course, this is 
this is all the things uh, ha have connections. But this is about freedom, about freedom of everything, about freedom of speech, about freedom of our country, about about all the anti-corruption institution which uh, uh, we built after the revolution, uh, about uh, freedom of uh, choice, uh, normal. Uh, elections and everything you know i think that everything uh, uh, has connection between the revolution and now which we have war but uh, i think that we have no other choice we can't say that you know uh, we should did nothing uh, in 2013 when yanukovych said that we don't the need um, European association. Uh, we we couldn't say that we will not fight for Donbass and everything, everything, you know. And uh, we will we will not say this never. I think we will not say that we will surround or so, something like this. This is like why I am sometimes um, uh, calm because of all of this crazy situation. I think that we have no other choice just to fight and we should win. And this is only one choice and everyone understands this. Uh, to continue, Anasya thought, uh, what I see is that uh, what Ukraine is doing is this as adequate country we are seeking for development. What has been started eight years ago and what, what's happening until now, this is this fight for development, the fight for democracy and the fight for the that uh, we can speak out what we think. And uh, what, what I appreciate of living in Ukraine for, for these years is the fact that if I'm unhappy about something, I can go out to the streets and to the protests. If I'm um, if I want to vote, I can change like it was last year, a couple of years. I can change my uh, place of registration and vote in Kiev if I'm even not registered there. I appreciate the fact that I can access different media and in free independent media, and there is uh, more is emerging. And so you can always check what you're finding and what what you're reading and where you get your information for. We have we work with number of civil society uh, uh, initiatives who are every day are fighting that there is adequate shelter, uh, adequate uh, housing, that there are the modernist architecture or architecture, uh, historical architecture is preserved. We see that the people are vocal and they want these changes and that we want to develop and uh, to move forward further on. And I think what, what's happening at the moment is continuation of this development that we are standing for, because we see that this is like, we know this, the taste of freedom and we know how to be free and we want to be free further on and not to have any restraints or thinking like, shall I say something or should I, uh, is it safe enough to protest against something, uh, against what I don't support, how, uh, whether there are institutions who can stand for my rights and for, uh, or like one of the examples that how the country is also digitalizing. We see that how this digi digital services are re-emerging and this is, this is happening over the last few years and uh, we see the, the accessibility of the services, how they also, uh, what I find immensely important is, uh, for example, the centralization reform. The local authorities on the local level are responsible for the decisions and what, how they see their uh, cities, municipalities, and villages are developing and changing. And this is what no one would like to give up because we know this, like how the freedom and how the, the way we want to live how it looks like and uh and that's the reason i think this continue how it started a year eight years ago and how it's going now and i believe it's going to continue further on it's not this uh, right now it's not a point where we say stop this is enough we are not ready to fight we are ready to fight and this is what we are doing for the last months as we see it i think what 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 also links all, all of this and, and this question back to the, the previous question about disinformation is that one of the narratives that, that has some traction in uh, outside of Russia as well is that, um, you know, uh, a country like Ukraine finds itself in the midst of this, this battle for geopolitical influence and then that um, uh, events such as Maidan uh, from the, the, the point of view of the Kremlin must have uh, uh, been uh, steered by uh, outside actors because it, but it, that that's basically it's it's the kind of it seems if you take it at face value it seems like a kind of projection 
um, from the entourage of, of, of Putin uh, on, on the outside world that that's because this is their toolbox uh, to always, you know, deal with provocations, hybrid warfare, etc. That there can be no such thing as um, a, a democratic will of the people in a, in a neighboring country. And um, I, I think what's and, and that every action has to be seen in the light of some kind of a, a nefarious plot by uh, uh, by, by by an uh, uh, enemy nation. Um, and I think, you know, that's also the assumption that they seem to have worked on when they thought that they could capture Kiev uh, in, uh, in, in a few uh, in a few days. Um, and and uh, yeah, it's it's something that's been um, that's been shown to be absolutely wrong by the uh, by the response of so many different Ukrainian citizens in the last uh, in in the last few weeks. Thank you, Roland. Uh, we're just now coming to the final question that we have for our discussion today, and I'm sure many people who are watching this. Uh, from outside of Ukraine would really like to get a sense of how can they help support Ukraine's effort to fight against the invasion. And I just wondered if you had any particular practical things that, that people watching today could, could take away and do. And what is the best kind of support? Because obviously there are, there are a whole load of different websites and organizations saying you can donate money to them. There's you no know, collection drives that are happening. Um, there are refugee uh, housing schemes that are opening as part of this response, but it would be it would be really useful to get a sense from yourselves what you think the most effective way is of helping uh, the effort against the invasion. So again, this is open to to anyone. So please feel free to, to kind of jump in as you wish. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe I can start a bit here. Um, I see it on different levels because uh, on the one hand, we should assess like if I'm not in Ukraine, what can I do in my country or what can I do uh, for people who are still in Ukraine? On the one hand, uh, for example, you can push uh, your uh, governments, local authorities or businesses and check with them what's their position on Ukraine. Was it because what we see right now? I hear myself for some reason. What we see right now that, uh, yes, we have sanctions, where, but there there needs to be clear understanding that uh, there is the sanctions need to be consistent and we need to push more for them. And this is, should come also from the ground, like check with, right to your MP or to local authorities, check what they are doing, whether they are supporting Ukraine and what, how can we push more for this? Or for the party, if you're a member of the Green Party, what the Green Party in your, in your country is doing on this? Because what we see, for example, if we talk about the gas independence, the risk, the polls already show that the people on the local level, they're keen to support gas independence or gas independence from Russia. But on the national level, we see that the, there are still discussions, even in Germany, we see that there is still like a speculations on how to be, how uh, on the, there, there could be done more. Let's put it this way. And uh, this the pushing and lobbying from uh, your government, your local authorities is important, shouldn't be undermined. The same goes with business. Check out whether the business or the corporation you're working with, whether they are having operations or supporting uh, Russia in any case. Because as we saw it with a number of huge businesses, with Nestle, Dan, Dan or, no, no, or, you, or other companies, some were uh, suspended their operations, some not. But the ones should be the understanding that uh, the taxes that are being, uh, being paid in Russia, they are also sp spent on the war here in Ukraine. In this case, maybe it's better if you know that you're, the, the, the company haven't left the uh, uh, Russian market. Maybe it's better to support local producer because the local producer is closer to you. And at the same time, it might potentially give some jobs to those people who moved from Ukraine to, uh, to one or another country. On the other hand, I think it's also crucial is uh, to share your stories and any reference. If you have friends or you ever visited Ukraine, tell about it like and show, tell the stories of your experience in Ukraine. I have a number of friends who were visiting me over the last years and they were amazed with the country and the, and the situation here. But this is like you can be vocal about the uh, the, the war that is here is hitting someone real life. It's not for us. The, the war here is not on TV or in the news. It's the conditions that we live in daily. 
And uh, the third thing, I, w I definitely think it's what's being appreciated a lot and what we get a lot of uh, so financial support and humanitarian aid because uh, some medicine are, are impossible to get in Ukraine and it's appreciated when the uh, medicine or first aid kits uh, or tourniquets are being sent uh, and uh, delivered to the uh, people on the front line or in the hospitals. And the same uh, thing is sending also donations because we see that uh, uh, sometimes it may be might be more complicated to, to know where and how to send the humanitarian aid. Sometimes it's easier to to donate to some organizations working operating right now in Ukraine. It should be it can be the like safe life in in UA those who are working with the military sector, or it could be any humanitarian aid or people working as uh, with evacuation of civilians. Like some of our activists, they work with Kriyiv Kavilnik. This is a local initiative uh, in Kiev who is uh, helping to evacuate people and to deliver the humanitarian aid. On the other hand, it's uh, like what, what I do encourage is also donating to, uh, to independent media because this is these are the voices that are going outside and speaking the truth that's happening in the moment. So there can be like, just to sum it up, it can be lobbying within your country with your decision makers and thinking what businesses are you supporting or not. On the other hand is... Uh, uh, sending hum any humanitarian aid uh, with uh, the charitable organizations or fun uh, uh, sending funds to the organizations that are already working here in Ukraine. Thank you. I don't know if Nastia, if you, if you, you would like to, to offer an answer. <laughs> I, I will say that like the truth was can I think about all of this because you know my father-in-law already in the army and I try to find for him helmet and everything and uh, yeah he will go to the somewhere on the border between Mykolaiv and Kherson region where the situation is very tough and I am worried of him of course my husband is waiting also for for the call from the army because he's an officer but he has very specific profession and he is waiting if he will need his um qual qualities uh, for, for the army and he is waiting yes and uh, we have one year old son who is with my parents and i can't see him for already months and for me is also my personal big uh, tragedy yes because he is so small and he will he will you know he will uh, 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 say some words uh, maybe after two months or three and I don't know if I will hear this or no because I'm here in Kiev and I uh, think that I should do what I do and it's important and our media mostly in Vinnytsia or in Lviv they are not in Kiev anymore and just a couple of us in Kiev in Kharkiv somewhere and uh, every day we understand I understand this in Kharkiv uh, that I can die in every moment because selling is everywhere, you know, and uh, what I think that it's very important to close the sky um, and uh, Ukraine. And uh, I think that all normal people uh, all around the world should understand that you can't protect your country uh, from Putin and from Russia if uh, Ukraine will not protect uh, ourselves. And it's not normal when uh, children are dying without water and food, as they are dying in Mariupol, or uh, as they die under the, you know, under the building. Uh, um, under the shelling, it's something that shouldn't exist. And uh, I was right in the opinion in American media that, you know, it's like a, how you will explain your children that it's, it's like, a, you know, Voldemort is weird, you know, and it's something that, you know, all of us believe in the kindness, in, in that good things uh, always win, but uh, it's not, you know, some pathetic words. It's, it's, uh, it's reality like this. It's, it, there is, evil and and something good and you should be on the good side because if not if you should if you think we will protect ourselves 
we we shouldn't came like and help Ukraine with heavy weapon or with with the close the sky. It's it's not working like this. It's it's mean that we all believe in different things. You know, it's all that we, we it's only in fairy tales uh, the kindness can win, and in reality the evil will win. And uh, I think that. It, it that I, I can't understand this why uh, the NATO countries uh, don't give us uh, heavy weapon enough because you know we can't fight Ukrainians of course are very brave but we can't fight uh, so long with guns uh, we can't uh, go with guns uh, uh, on the tanks you know we we can but we will not win in the in this fight you know and it's important to have enough heavy weapon it's important to have uh air defense system it's important to close the sky because it's there is no there is no children ukrainian children it's all our children then they should leave what it's everything what i think Thank you. And I think that's a really important message that, that people can get involved in and speak to their respective governments about and to campaign on uh, in support of, of closing the sky as well. Uh, Roland, do you have any particular thoughts and comments on how people can uh, support the effort, uh, how people can get involved, particularly as I know you've, you've been seeing uh, Europeans, you know, obviously traveling to Poland uh, and other places to, to provide assistance and support? Uh, well, on, on top of everything that's been, been said already, it's it's hard to add, but maybe uh, one one thing that really um, yeah, leaps out uh, at me here in Poland is that um, many people have uh, have organized themselves, basically, um, to, uh, to, to, to help others. Um, but uh, a lot of this volunteer power, um, I mean, these volunteers have already burned through a lot of their energy in the first few weeks and are, are also uh, clamoring out for structural, uh, you know, uh, uh, decisions to be made um, to solve the housing crisis that will uh, arise here, maybe in some other countries as well, but certainly in Poland. Um, now people are staying um, uh, with, with families, but, uh, but how about in six months? So, you know, it's, uh, the question is also how do you keep that attention span going? And for that, you will need some, first of all, you have to check yourself uh, in a way that, that we can all do as individuals. Uh, it's not because uh, some of the attention of the, to the world may be focused elsewhere. Um, that we shouldn't uh, keep on paying attention to what's happening in Ukraine. So that's just something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, but on top of that, you also want uh, your government to take, uh, I think, with all the structural decisions now that will allow for those people who do flee uh, Ukraine, and, and there's millions, um, for them to, to, to have really, um, uh, yeah, uh, sustainable uh, solutions in, in, in the countries where, uh, where where they're ending up and, and not just uh, uh, being glad that, that citizens have organized themselves and applauded for that, but then uh, leave, leave it at that, basically. Um, and then in a broader uh, sense, uh, yeah, it, it's, it is really, I mean, what this crisis has shown is that um, it does make sense, even for people who are peace-minded, to uh, uh, to to at least support the development of some kind of military doctrine within the countries of the European Union. Um, it's something that you also hear a lot from uh, uh, from from people within Ukraine to say, "Well, I used to be a pacifist, but uh, there is no way to be a pacifist in this uh, context." So, um, and in a way, I think that's something that certain European countries, Germany notably, are are slowly learning. Um, but uh, but yeah, you, you have to, now is the time to think really hard about that and how far we want to take it. Thank you. And there's, there's definitely a whole different wide array of various ways that you can uh, get in touch with your governments. Obviously, different countries have different systems, but, you know, make sure you're writing to your representatives to keep uh, Ukraine on the agenda and to, to do everything that you possibly can to 
ensure that you can pressure your respective governments into into providing that much much needed support in the various ways that our speakers have, have described and i know i certainly will be uh, writing to my representative again after this to to really make sure that this point is, is sustained um and i know that several countries as well there are many different rallies of support uh, there's going to be for example a huge rally uh, where i am here in london uh, on saturday and really just to to make sure that this awareness has been kept up uh, and also seeing what your various different countries around can can do particularly in terms of not only sanctions on russia but also ensuring that there is that correct kind of military support there is that that well-being support that is being provided to so i would really urge people to uh, get in touch with their representatives about these issues and see how they can contribute so i, I really want to thank our speakers for for taking their time to come and have a conversation with us uh, and I think it's been so important for us to, to hear all of your voices and all of your perspectives uh, and know that we are listening and that we do hear what you were you were telling us and we will ensure that others will hear what you've said as well. Uh, I, I just want to thank our, our speakers, thank you to, to Nastia, to Sophia and to Roland for, for joining us today uh, and know that you know this is not you know, a point where a conversation stops. This is not a point where support ends. Know that we fully and completely support all of you uh, and that we really want to do everything we can uh, to put pressure and maintain pressure on ensuring support to, and, and know that we are behind you and that we really want you to, to beat Russia and to win in this particular to conflict. So thank you to, to all of our speakers joining us for today. Um, just a just a quick note for our speakers on the technical issue where we're even though you won't be appearing on screen for this next section please feel free to kind of stay behind uh to, to speak at the end as well so thank you very much to, to all of our speakers joining today i can see already in the comments that there's quite a few uh thank yous that are coming in as well so uh every edition of the green screen that we do uh, we also have uh, a bit of something that we call our artistic spot that is slightly uh, not directly connected to the topic of discussion, but still uh, very much endures the themes that, that we are discussing. So we bring a small cultural offering that we call the artistic spot. Uh, and we're going to be talking about this month, the work of the band Pretty Loud in Serbia, uh, who are the first Roma girl band, uh, and they use uh, rap, hip hop vocals, uh, and ancestral Roma music combined with contemporary and urban movement and traditional dance. Uh, and through their lyrics, they are really talking about a whole wide range of really complex topics, from race representation, social justice, and also uh, how many of them have grown up within conflict and witnessed a lot of horrors and conflict themselves. Uh, just a quick content warning that there is uh, going to be, of course, discussion about violence against women and girls in this video as well. So we're now just going to see our uh, artistic spot video. Our community suffered a great deal from war. 20 years after the last war, we are still suffering from its long-term effects. As women. As Roma. All we have to say is, no, no more war. No more destruction. Let's build for our children. I'm a proud 50, they don't want me in the club. My skin is different wall, so they always want me out. Don't care about my feelings, my personality, how I rock. All the dance war with my moves, so sweet. But I don't wanna fight, just to dance the pain away. Come together now, join us in the pain. I am Vata. I am Sylvia. I am Eva. I am Diana. I am Elma. I am Selma. We are pretty loud. Pretty Loud is the first Roma girl band in the world. We are six members from Serbia. Grab encouraged us to create Pretty Loud. We created this band to talk about Roma women problems and women in general. Mama više neće biti u suzama. We fight for women's rights, for equality. We fight against early marriages and against violence. Ali morate mangel žutvate ovel. Pedar de soro lafi, te na gazinel. Ađikare samanta, romelelja. Hem sarine ja jeda odovao i namam ja. Nikad oj bahta lina kao ovel. A lako roda, olaki men kapira vel. We will fight for all women. They all deserve their rights. We don't think music is a toy. 
For us, music is a weapon. Through music, we share our messages and everyone can find themselves in our lyrics. We are sure that with music we break stereotypes about Roma. We represent our community in better ways. That's how we support and motivate young Roma girls and women. Music is not the only way for fun. We support women to use what they think is the best from them and what makes them happy. Our goal is to show that a woman can be brave, strong, independent, and to be able to make decisions on her own. Bye. I think the words uh, are pretty loud summed it up um, quite well for our discussion tonight that we we don't want no more war, no more destruction and and let's build for our children. Uh, and it was really amazing to see the work that Pretty Loud had been doing. Alongside Pretty Loud, there were also many, obviously, Ukrainian artists uh, who are calling for no more war and no more destruction. Uh, and I would also encourage, alongside exploring the work of Pretty Loud, you can always, always explore uh, the work of other uh, Ukrainian artists, such as the likes of Jamala or Kalush Orchestra, who are really, really talking out about the situation in Ukraine as well. So we will be back very soon with our next edition of Green Screen, uh, and we'll be making an announcement via social media on what is the future of the project and what will be happening. We want to once again say a huge thank you to our panel uh, and that we wish for them to uh, be safe in the, in the coming weeks and that we will continue to provide as much solidarity and support that we can. Uh, I also just want to thank the technical team behind the scenes who have helped uh, pull things together for tonight's panel. Uh, we will obviously see you next time and we all hope that everyone watching stay safe uh, and healthy and we wish you a good evening.